So we were just discussing the value that an accurate system of perspective had in a time where uh, people were no longer afraid of being accused of committing idolatry. Uh, people were really comfortable capturing things the way that they perceived them visually, and any advantage they had uh, that allowed them to understand how to convey that more successfully was a huge advantage. And one of the artists that exercised the advantage of perspective systems, and not just linear perspective, we'll see another one in a second, uh, but considered to be a Renaissance era perspective master was this guy Masaccio. That's a good Italian artist named Masaccio. Uh, this is also evidence of that thing that I was mentioning before in um, the Italian language, or at least when they name things themselves, uh, it has more of a mobster in intonation than anything else. Um, Masaccio's real name was Tommaso del Sir Giovanni de Simona Casai. It was a very, very melodious a uh, pleasant name, and Masaccio doesn't sound bad itself, but uh, Masaccio translates loosely to Big Ugly Tom, which is a horrible, horrible nickname, and the fact that we still refer to him as Masaccio today uh, probably has to be insulting, I assume. But there are, there are several evidences of this, um, like Il Duomo, uh, uh, Cathedral de Santa Maria de Fiori. But in this particular one, so he's exercising linear perspective, as we see here. Um, this was done in a private chapel, as I mentioned, and the two donors, the major patrons, were uh, the father and the lady of the house here, and they're essentially saying that um, they personally had this vision where, in wherein they witnessed the crucifixion of the father of the, well, Trinity with the Virgin, in reference here, is the crucifixion of Christ, but you also have you know, God himself and this little white thing right there above Jesus' head is the Holy Spirit. And I wish I could zoom in on that. You'll just have to trust me that that is a dove representing the presence of the Holy Spirit. And this is St. John, the evangelist, and that's the Virgin Mary. And then you have your patrons along the side who are removed from the image, but still you know, framing it so they still have some significance. They get to be involved, but they definitely weren't there at the crucifixion itself. Now, another interesting point here below this is a sarcophagus with a skeleton on top of it, uh, which is suggestive of death. And then, of course, on top of that is an engraving. You may or might not, may not be able to see it um, loosely translates to that which I am, you too shall be. So that which I am, a skeleton, you too shall be. Like one day, you're going to be just as dead and gone as this skeleton is. But uh, it's important to remember when when this time comes that you're still mindful of this time. Um, it's essentially it's an early form of what we're going to become uh, come known. Or what's what's going to become known as a vanitas image. And a vanitas image is a warning against overindulgence, and we're going to see these a lot more in the 17th century, but it's essentially saying that you can enjoy life as much as you want to now, but just keep in mind that one day you're going to die, and when this happens to you, you better be right with all of this that happened for you. So that's one Masaccio, and let's see if we can move on to another one. Now in this one, the linear perspective isn't quite so prevalent, but he's exercising something he's called atmospheric perspective. Uh, atmospheric perspective is, uh, there's a lot of science to it, but it's loosely the theory that the further away something is from you, um, the, the less contrast it's going to have and the less detail it's going to have. And it's not necessarily that it's lighter or darker as it moves away from you, it's just the range of contrast is going to be a lot shorter. So when you see up here, and everything is happening in the foreground, you get some really dark, dark values, and you get some light, light values, and they're in really close proximity to each other, so you get a lot of strong contrast. Now, as you move from one stage to another stage to another stage of depth, you lose just a little bit more of that information, and you still have light values, and you still have dark values, but it's just those light values tend to be a lot more gray, and the dark values tend to be a lot more gray, and you just get muted shades of gray in relationship to one another, uh, as a, compared to up here, where you get a lot of fine detail and strong contrast. So hopefully that's something that's comprehensible. It's not all that complicated, just something to keep in mind. So, let's 
skip that one and talk about Sandro Botticelli, which also is conveniently not his birth name. Uh, Sandro Botticelli's real name was Alessandro di Mariani de, de Vini Felipepi, which is a really good name too, but Sandro Botticelli also has a really nice Italian ring to it. Problem is, uh, this Botticelli part. Botticelli means little barrel. There are a lot of theories as to how he got that nickname, some less flattering than others, but just know that's that's not his nickname, but I don't think that you could drop the name Alessandro Di Mariani Di Vanni Filippi into a conversation and have uh, people understand you, even if it's even if it's art historians. They're going to know the name Sandro Botticelli first. Now, this is a really big painting, five and a half feet by nine feet, that was commissioned by the Medici family. Of course, the Medici family. Uh, Sandro Botticelli was was an artist that they personally had uh, on their payroll. Um, they paid all of his bills. They made sure that he was taken care of, had all the supplies he needed. And his job was just to paint for them. Um, this was supposed to be a, peri- a, a part of a series of eight separate paintings um, that had pagan themes similar to this one. Um, but all the other seven were burned. It was for what were referred to as the bonfires of the vanities. Um, there was a, a very distinct and intentional opponent of the Medici family in Florence named Savonarola, who was, I believe, a cardinal. And um, he would host these things, events called Bonfires of the Vanities, where he would encourage people to uh, throw away all of their luxuries, their, jewel- their jewelry, their books, their paintings, their their fine clothing, because those indulgences were, were moving them further and further away from God. And uh, these events were almost single-handedly directed in opposition to the Medici family at the behest of Savonarola, um, in the name of the church. Really interesting things I mentioned before that the Medici family ended up with two popes. Uh, the first Medici pope uh, actually had Savonarola um, burned in what was essentially a, a parody of the bonfires of the vanities in Florence. He, t- they were, he was tied to a post and then burned alive, um, basically for standing in their way. There were some personal grievances there that extend beyond that, but it's just a general rule of thumb that you didn't get in the way of the Medici family. Now, it's paganism, which means that it's offensive to the Catholic Church. Uh, one of the ways we know that this was commissioned by the Medici family and was not ever intended to leave the household of the Medici family, uh, it also has uh, some pretty deliberate nudity here, which is also something that, again, the uh, Catholic Church was not a huge fan of. And then it's not just that it's the nudity, it's that we're actually supposed to be indulging in this in a slightly sexual nature. It's almost like soft core pornography of the Renaissance era. And it brings up a very interesting story about generally the the generation story of, of Venus herself, the birth of Venus stories that, um, oh, well, Poseidon's manliness was cut off and thrown into the ocean and actually impregnated the ocean itself, which is uh, both where, you know, this Venus was born from, but also why they why they thought that sea foam existed, you know, like those, the bubbles that wash up on the beach. Yeah, going to the beach was a very interesting time, I guess, if you were a, a Renaissance era Italian. But anyway, the uh, Zephyr here um, sees the clamshell and blows it to shore, where which it springs open, and then you know this uh, a perfect female figure exists within the inside of it. That's how Venus is born, and then uh, the nymph of spring is over here. Um, introducing the greenery and vegetation, not just to the land, but also, you know, providing something with the Venus figure to wear. Um, It's also rumored that the model that posed to be the Venus figure here is the niece of Amerigo Vespucci, which may or may not be true, but I do like that that it gives you another reference here just to tell you, like, this is the age of exploration um, of the many things happening during the Renaissance and all the cultural and technological progressions. Like, we're, we're really selling all over the world. We're really exploring the firmament to its extremities. We're really doing a good job of just trying to understand everything that's happening around us and to us and for us, just depending on what your perspective is. We'll skip all this stuff. And when it comes to Leonardo da Vinci, He's a fascinating, absolutely fascinating guy who deserves every bit of the attention that he gets. But I do feel like he was a lot better at uh, hydraulics and botany and astronomy than he was at painting. He was a very successful, accomplished painter. 
but he was head and shoulders above almost anybody else in his generation at the sciences. So it's almost a disservice for to be to have him introduced as a, as an artist above everything else. In fact, you know, you notice this Last Supper painting hasn't aged all that well. Um, a lot of that's because he experimented, being a scientist, experimented with different painting techniques and different media. Um, he tried to introduce oil into a fresco process that didn't age all that well, which is one of the reasons why this thing looks as rough as it does today. In fact, if you look, there's a doorway that's been put right through the middle of this thing. Now, originally, this was a painting that was done in the uh, lunchroom in the cafeteria area of a monastery. And uh, people have complained throughout time that, you know, the tables wouldn't have looked like this. The silverware wouldn't have looked like this. Like, why are they always sitting on one side of the table? Uh, the reason for that is that the tables that would have been out here that the monks themselves would have eaten at, the silverware, the tableware that they would have actually used would have looked like the stuff that's on the table uh, in the painting here. They wanted to have this relationship between the monks who were eating in the, you know, in the 15th and 16th century in this cafeteria and the the actual Last Supper itself. So they, you know, sort of put the uh, Christ and his apostles in a more modern setting to make it more relevant to the uh, to the monks. However, when this thing started to kind of fall apart due to age, um, they apparently realized that it was more beneficial to them to have a doorway through here uh, than it was to maintain the painting. Um, there are a lot of Leonardo da Vinci paintings that, that have been sort of concealed behind walls and have been covered up one way or another. We're beginning to find them. Um, you know, at least one or two every couple of years is beginning to show up, which is really fascinating. But it also sort of shows that, well, his work didn't hold up all that well, uh, at least not as well as most others of the uh, of the Italian fresco generation, at least. But anyway, let's see what's next for Leonardo. Vitruvian man uh, relates closely back to the whole idea of the Greeks and proportions, shows that he was a man of, a sci of scientific investigation. The Mona Lisa. If you go to the Louvre today, you will find hundreds and hundreds of people crowding around this ultimately very small painting. This is much smaller than probably 90% of any of the other artworks that we've looked at. It's a very small painting that was done by Leonardo da Vinci of uh, the wife of a wealthy Florentine merchant. There's a lot of debate as to who the Mona Lisa is supposed to be, uh, but we've pretty much got it nailed down. It was... Uh, the, her name was Lisa Gerardini del Giocondo, um, and she was basically just a, a wealthy housewife of her generation. And the legend around this is it just grew from the fact that Leonardo da Vinci himself really got into this painting to the point where uh, it was one of the few paintings he finished completely. And then he liked it so much that he refused, he refused to give it back to the, uh, to the man who paid him to make it. He's like, no, this is my painting now. It's like, I know you paid me for it, but, uh, yeah, I'm going to keep this one. Um, another thing that becomes so controversial about this is the, the general expression that the Mona Lisa figure has. Um, it's one that's pretty much blank. And the reason for that is she doesn't have eyebrows. Um, she doesn't have eyebrows because it was fashionable at the time for women to pluck their eyebrows and to even raise their hairline just a little bit. As you can see, has probably happened here. And that was because the, the Queen of Spain at the time had alopecia and basically just made it fashionable for people to have, you know, slightly receding hairlines and to have their eyebrows falling out. Um, so women throughout uh, Spain and Italy followed suit and did much the same thing. Uh, the interest in this particular painting continues in that uh, once Leonardo finished this painting, one of the few paintings that he actually finished in his lifetime, he was so all over the place that a lot of the thing, the work that he started just never got finished. Uh, he did return it to the patron, to the, the husband who commissioned this painting of his wife, but then held on to it until his death and then bequeathed it to his favorite servant, who was uh, undoubtedly uh, his life partner. Um, it doesn't get publicity a lot, but Leonardo da Vinci was undoubtedly homosexual, and for the remaining, for the final decades of his life, uh, he had this one uh, servant, assistant, that he had a very close personal relationship to, and when, Mon when Leonardo da Vinci died, he left the Mona Lisa to that servant. Now, after that, uh, the painting was given to the Uffizi Gallery. It was, it was stolen twice. It completely disappeared and would reappear again. Uh, there, there's a lot of controversy around this particular painting, 
uh, that extends beyond just just who is who is in it.